great to have you on the program. Let's hold in on one of those headline stories now. The death of apartheid's last president has drawn into sharp focus debates around what is ex an acceptable response to the passing of public figures and what that ought to look like. So depending on who you ask, F.W. de Klerk should either be lauded or deeply admonished for the role he played in South Africa's social political history. As you know by now, the 85-year-old died on Thursday after a long battle with cancer. His legacy has been contested since then and... I'd like to bet we'll continue to draw divergent views for quite some time. So how should we be reflecting on the man post his death? Eusebius Makaiser is a contributor and analyst for Times Life. He joins us now via Vidilink for more on his thoughts around this. And Eusebius, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks very much indeed for putting aside some time. Full disclosure, I reached out to you after listening to your podcast with Sisonke on In the Ring with Eusebius Makaiser. So I'm going to be ventilating some of the issues that come up, at least in that discussion, if that's okay. Among the fascinating questions to be asked is, how should we be reflecting uh, around the death of public figures regardless of the role they play? In other words, can we ever have time where we say it's a bit too soon to be critical about the role they've played? Good morning, Ayanda, and for your viewers, Ayanda is not making me nervous. If the image looks a little bit uneven, it's because I'm having fun down here in Klebera, and um, I'm on my phone just walking around this lovely beach apartment. Look, there's no one way to remember an historical figure. Mm. When someone is exceptional, like Nelson Mandela, you might, for example, say to a broadcaster, as was said to me at 7.02, you see, yes, you can debate the man's legacy, but please show some humanity. And in the first broadcast, if Nelson Mandela were to pass away this evening, Please make sure that you at least allow people an opportunity to pour their hearts out, to emote, to show affect. You can always come back tomorrow morning for a critical discussion. But I think that F.W. de Klerk does not deserve that kind of uh, reprieve from a critical discussion in the moments of his death. His death was so choreographed, in fact, Ayanda, that the seven-minute video that was released was emotional manipulation. It was an attempt to direct the way in which we remember him what we say, what we don't say, and quite frankly, it was cynical. And so as far as I'm concerned, there are many ways in which one can respond. If you want to respond with grace, that is okay, but do not police the emotions and the tonality of millions of black South Africans who want to respond differently to his death, and I'm one of those. Yeah, let's talk a bit more about those final moments, for lack of a better term, that declared then shade uh, post his death, or at least his foundation. There are many who believe that once someone is at death's door, that, uh, the, that moment is big enough to genuinely have them view the world differently. Does it matter mm -hmm. if by the time de Klerk died that he viewed separate development, as he prefers to call it, differently? No, because he didn't do it when it mattered most. Mm. Um, as Desmond Tutu rightly said, he had missed the Klerk that is an opportunity to really come into his own in terms of full maximum humanity years ago. Here's the thing. If you are either an architect of evil or you are one of the foot soldiers of evil, then you've got to reckon with your past while you are still alive. If that video was recorded when he was still Compass Mentors, then the question has to be asked, Ayanda, why release it posthumously? Why not release it, for example, three years earlier so that you can engage Ayanda Nyati's grandparents who suffered under your policies in the 60s, 70s, 80s while you were in cabinet. You don't have an opportunity to speak to your victims. You don't have an opportunity to ask them, do you accept my apology? The man goes to his grave with many secrets. There are millions of black South Africans who did not die peacefully in their sleep at the age of 85 because of what the player did. There are millions of black South Africans who don't have closure because he never disclosed the full facts of what he knew, what he did, what he ordered, and what happened under his watch. And if black South Africans can walk around with the trauma of not knowing the full truth because the cleric never disclosed, if black South Africans can live with the trauma of the cleric never having conceded that apartheid is a crime against humanity, then why on earth is it obligatory to respond with grace in the moment of his death? Mm. And of course, there are some people who will still choose to do that, to respond with grace, right? And in fact, one of my favorite parts of your discussion with Sosonke was when you put it to her that, you know, it almost feels like there's an expectation 
for black South mm. Africans in particular to always yeah. be the better people, to turn the other cheek, to mm. forgive, for lack of a mm. better term. And Sasonke mm. responds quite majestically to that and cautions yes, us mm. against, I guess, looking down on people who choose to do that because those who forgive don't do so because they're stupid. Yeah, you make, a, you make a beautiful point, Ayanda. I've just missed you there, but I'll speak into the point. If black people who are older than us in particular want to respond with grace, they do so precisely because there is a black tradition of not letting your own humanity be compromised by the behavior of white supremacists. And so there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing that I would add to that is that equally, if a black person wanted to respond with anger or with rage, we should also not believe that. There is a multiplicity of equally acceptable emotional responses to the event that is the cleric's death. Grace is acceptable. Equally acceptable is rage. And it's not a choice between rage or grace. Both of those have a place in the emotional spectrum of ways in which we can respond to someone like the cleric. Yeah. Do you envision a context where the grace itself could cloud people's ability to heal? In other words, mm. there's almost a feeling that those who have the moral compass to go down the grace route could, in some respects, um, make it difficult for those who don't to essentially heal. I'm not sure if I'm making sense here, but th this idea that... You are making sense, and I right. totally, totally agree with yeah. you. And I think the way to overcome that problem is to not take the moral high ground. If you respond with grace and you take out your Bible and you say, I believe in God, I'm a Christian, or whatever the case might be, let it be. There's nothing more to be gained from stomping on the ground of F.W. De Klerk. That's okay. That's how you want to respond. But for goodness sake, do not produce the space for other people to respond differently. For example, I come from this in part through a moral philosophy lens. I think that if you want to be fully forgiven as the clerk, then you needed to do certain things which you can't do and you never did while you were alive. Full disclosure is a precondition to be forgiven. He never fully disclosed everything that he knew and everything that he did. The second thing that is necessary for you to be entitled to grace is that you need to accept morally and politically what you did and what your role was in the making of the apartheid state and in its execution. And he never did that. He had the audacity of going around the world and trying to defend separate development as a policy that has got good intentions behind it. But separate development was and is intrinsically racist. And it's based on the idea that white people are so superior to you and me, Ayanda, that there shouldn't be social contact between them and us. So as far as I'm concerned, if you take out your Bible and you want to say, let it be, let God judge and not us, that is okay, but mm -hmm. there are excellent, excellent historical, moral, normative, and other kinds of reason to not extend grace to F.W. the text. And so it is wrong for those people who respond with grace to try and police the anger of those South Africans who do not want to show him grace. There is a case to be made for all of these different responses to him. It's a beautifully made point. As expected, a lot of debates around what we should do now with this title that the clerk has from the, uh, the, the Nobel Peace Prize, essentially, that he shared with Nelson Mandela. I mean, I wonder from your vantage point whether there's anything that the Nobel um, Council, for lack of a better term, can do now, given the reflections that are coming mostly from black South Africans around the kind of legacy that the clerk leaves behind. It's too late. You can't unscramble an egg, so mm -hmm. the price must stay. The question in retrospect is that he deserved it all along, and the answer is, of course, no. There's no moral equivalence between him and the giant moral statue of Nelson Mandela. He should be so lucky in the first instance to have got the Nobel Peace Prize. It was given to him hastily. So Sonke Mutamang makes an interesting point. She argues that it was almost given to him in the hope that he will live up, up to the expectation of the Nobel Peace Prize, that it was almost deliberately given to him prematurely so that the end game of apartheid can be fully, fully endorsed and executed and we don't actually have a secret slip back into apartheid but the truth of the matter is side by side with nelson mandela he was projecting an image that they are equally deserving of the price and that's nonsense because there was no full disclosure because there was no reckoning with his own action and inaction because he still insisted until his dying days that apartheid is not a crime against humanity he did not 
and still does not deserve the price. But nothing will be gained legalistically by trying to lobby for having it taken away posthumously. Eusebius Makaiser, always great chatting to you, sir. Thank you very much for your generosity and insight. Eusebius is a contributor and analyst for Times Live. Once again, thanks very much indeed.